These are two, uh, what I think are two of absolutely the smartest people in this game. And uh, both of them have managed to create a tremendous amount of success as artist managers and kind of coming at it from different perspectives, which I think is going to be really exciting in this conversation. Uh, I'll start with Larry. Um, Larry is a good friend of mine and uh, manages uh, a client that we had on our webcast, our webinar a few weeks ago, um, Evan Bogart. And, uh, and Larry also manages Ricky Reed and Danger and works very closely with Ricky on his Nice Life label. Actually, I think Larry, the president of the label, if I'm not mistaken, right? Am I getting that wrong? Well, I, I am the COO of Nice Life Recording Company. There you go. So he is the COO, which is, which is pretty important. Um, and uh, and they've done a, a really an incredible job. And and I want actually Larry, as he gets into, to really discuss the evolution of Ricky Reed as he as he sort of went from being an artist in wallpaper to becoming a, a, a not only a successful producer but like probably one of the top five most successful record producers in, in pop music today. And also, I really I'm looking forward to discussing sort of how Lizzo happened um, because obviously Lizzo is uh, is a game-changing artist right now uh, and really revolution, uh, rev, revolutionizing, that's not a word, uh, the pop music game. And then, uh, so that's Larry. And then Brad, uh, this is actually no word of a line. I'm going simpl to simplify it a little bit more. Brad and I met on a goat field in Israel, basically. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and we really quick quickly and uh, just developed a friendship and a mutual respect for each other. Um, we went into our first meeting and I'm not looking for a manager. And I came out of the meeting uh, and we're like, OK, well, I guess let's try it. <laughs> so um, and Brad is my partner on our anti-gravity uh, music publishing record label uh, in China and a management company. And uh, aside from management, which we are not going to really discuss today at all, he manages some pretty unbelievably cool artists like Phantom Planet, Dan the Automator from Gorillaz. Uh, and a new uh, kind of sort of re-emerging pop artist named Jake Miller uh, that I've actually also oh, had yeah. the pleasure of working with. So, uh, Brad and Larry, welcome mm -hmm. and thank you very much for helping us and participating today. Hey, thanks, thanks for having me. me. Uh, Larry, do you want to sort of, do you feel like you want to, can you sort of uh, outline a little bit more your, uh, your, your roles and your sort of day-to-day -day and what you do and a little philosophy maybe? That's so much. Brad won't get to talk if I say all of that because <laughs> I almost stopped talking. Um, I moved here almost it'd be 18 years in August, uh, kind of to manage my best friend. So I felt like I was one of the first homie manager guys uh, that came out here to LA to try to make it happen with his best friend. And it actually kind of worked out. I mean, I lost the friendship. He got really rich. And then I haven't done so bad for myself. So I feel actually pretty good about it and uh, had a little bit of heartache with losing him and, you know, him helping him connect to Bruno Mars. And then Bruno became Bruno Mars and they got, you know, really successful. And, you know, that's a difficult pill to swallow. But every I think every great music person, if you're a manager, songwriter, producer, marketing person, whatever, you have your your music business experience where, you know, it's probably a little tough, probably have a little heartache, but you learn from it and then you grow and then something great happens because you're able to take that experience from what you you felt you've lost to gain uh, for the future. So uh, that was mine. And, you know, for a while there, it was really, really bitter that it didn't work out, but, you know, very happy for for Philip, who was my guy. And, 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 and I still have a relationship with him and, and Bruno, but you know, definitely uh, that experience really helped me in the future. So uh, from there, I ended up meeting Evan Bogart, who I work with, who was on, who uh, works with you a lot, Justin and, and Brad, and um, and uh, was on this wonderful webinar at one point. And really, that was the start of my career. It's, uh, you know, he had just, he had written SOS for Rihanna. Uh, so he had a bit of a name. He was building a company called The Writing Camp. They were starting to sign writers, which was, you know, something that writers and producers did. You obviously had Dr. Dre, you had, you know, Pharrell and Chad and, you know, those those crews of people were doing this. But I felt like, you know, during that time, it wasn't as widespread. I think now every writer and producer feels like they should and they can. And I think because of the way this business is now and how entrepreneurial it is, I think it gives the opportunity to do that. more. So. I'm going to say that Evan was and his team were very early on and and best idea 
Um, and so I was managing him and kind of running that, that company for them. Um, and then that, that introduced us to Ricky Reed, who then Evan signed to records and publishing. Um, I was helping him with that and, and helping Evan with that and really involved. And then, um, when Ricky's manager, as I call him, although I'm the manager, but the, his man, guy, best friend passed away from leukemia, I kind of took over and started to, to we started our quest to get here. Um, um, and so that kind of brings me to here, to be honest, it's like the, the big three moments for me are moving out to manage Philip, introducing him to Bruno, then being rich and leaving, or leaving me, then being rich, <laughs> meeting Evan, then meeting Ricky. And that, that kind of gives you a big swath of how I got here. And, you know, it's, again, there was some hurt involved, some, you know, some experience that you don't want. I don't wish on everyone because you don't want to lose a client and then go see them at, you know, the forum, you know, and, and say, dang, I, I was a part of that at one point. Um, um, I am proud of it though, because it was good to be, I, it was great times when I was around them. Um, but also, being able to use that information and and with Ricky as he started his ascend with producing Talk Dirty randomly for Jason Derulo, which then kind of allowed us to pivot from him being an artist to him producing for other people to producing 21 Pilots Bur Blurry Face album and executive producing that to then, um, you know, Leon Bridges and The Weeknd and all these wonderful artists, but then finding his own artist and developing it for three years and then it kind of explode um in the weirdest way possible and well don't give that away yet don't give that away okay. yet because okay. because okay. i want you know because I, I i i i need to be able to ask a couple questions it's the arc man it's the it's the you know it's the experience of the arc well you you're the one that messed me up you said Say all this stuff, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's great. It's, it's great. I appreciate it. But, but I want, I want, you know, I, I think it's important to, to, to kind of get into that because I, I, I love so much, love the Lizzo story, and, um, and, and I really want to dig into that because I think it's actually really relatable to so many of the people I'm on call. And then here's Brad. So Brad comes at management from a little bit of a different perspective because Brad, you, you worked in the label system as an executive. You worked as a publisher. Uh, as an executive, and then eventually you you ended up kind of going over to Rock Nation as an executive manager, and now you're kind of doing your thing. So maybe give us a little dis a little discovery of your journey, if possible. That'd be amazing. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's it's a little different than uh, Larry, but that's that's the beautiful thing about management. There really is no rule in the beginning on how one gets going and everyone's story and everyone's journey is different. So yeah, it, indeed, I started uh, as a label A&R working up the, the ranks at, uh, at Sony Music and uh, you know, working with artists back in the day, like Good Charlotte and the Madden Brothers uh, you know, band and then uh, Phantom Planet, which you know, I'll, I'll come back on. <clears throat> Excuse me. After a little bit of time, I uh, I left the company to start managing an artist that um, that you know her album actually never came out. But I signed her to to Epic, and ironically, I showcased her for a number of publishers. And Justin's you know three publishers ago, BMG, the original BMG, uh, said, "Hey, look, you know she's great. We're not going to sign her, but we want to offer you a job," which I wasn't looking for. So uh, they made me an offer that made more sense than managing a developing artist at the time. And uh, I, I took it and I became a publisher for the better part of a decade, working up the ranks on that side of the business until, um, you know, I guess 20, 2014, something, give or take around there. Uh, I was at Warner Chapel and uh, in a regime shift, uh, as these things happen to executives, I was presented with an option to to figure out what the next game plan would would be, and you know, Larry, coincidentally, I actually when I was at Warner Chapel uh, through Ross Golan, who's a, a writer that I worked with, uh, I met Wallpaper when he was Wallpaper. Uh, I don't think if I recall he was looking for a deal, just meeting people, and uh, uh, who would have known how uh, how wonderful his journey has become under your guidance and and, and that explosion. But uh, that again, you know, just ties into like the management side of things. Like you never know where. Uh, relationships are going to stem from how they they turn into stuff, uh, how they you know into you know monetized assets or turn into relationships. I mean, like Justin mentioned, we met literally 
you know, in a field uh, with goats, <laughs> and, uh, and and it turned into a, you know a, a amazing partnership, um, not only from a management client perspective, but you know just running a a company, and, um, and, and you know, and so yeah, my my client roster um, evolved out of my relationship with Rock Nation. Uh, I worked for a joint venture that was tied in with the company, and when I first started there, I helped them build a publishing company. Uh, which now runs through Cobalt. I help them uh, with a cross-section of responsibilities, both administratively and creatively on the label that they had. And then um, I was I was sitting there, I was like, man, I, I feel a little unfulfilled because I was hopping from initiative to initiative and project to project, but I didn't have any ownership over anything I was doing. But I had said to myself, I didn't want to be a manager. And, uh, and eventually uh, I started building a rapport with a legacy hip hop producer, a guy by the name of Dan the Automator, who's probably best known for his work in the early days uh, with the Gorillas. You know, he and Damon Auburn had started it, and uh, you know they had a lot of success together. You know, and that stemmed from even uh, a more credible uh, underground project called Doctor Octagon, and and you know he went on to do Handsome Boy Modeling School and worked with pretty much you know every contemporary from you know Jack Johnson to the BC Boys um, and everyone in the in the early aughts I think that they're referred to now. So um, I, I want to talk about Dan and in uh, Justin. I'll let you continue the story arc, you know, this, and not give it all away. But you know the clients that I have now, you know, Phantom Planet. You know, it's a full circle moment. You know, I was their junior A and R on uh, on their first record, which you know had a pretty significant hit called California. Um, you know, that was a, a defining song at the time, and I helped them put back get back together. Uh, and I'll tell you that story later if you guys want. Uh, and they're releasing their first album in over a decade. And then Dan, I had to uh, figure out how we were going to push the elbows out. You know, he doesn't operate in the same capacity as a Ricky Reed working with contemporary frontline artists, um, you know, but he has a lot of respect and he has a lot of legacy and hits of the past. So uh, we were given an opportunity or created an opportunity, I should say, for him to move into the scoring world. And he's become very prolific and, and very successful um, shifting his career. So I think, you know, as a manager, uh, it's not just about what's in front of you. It's about the strategy that you need to lay ahead. Uh, and, and that's really where uh, I, I like to to focus my energy uh, a lot of the time, so I'll I'll shut up here and and let Justin kind of steer the ship a little bit. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, you guys, by the way, apologies for the uh, for the, for I don't know if you guys are getting these dings as people are coming in and out of the meeting. I apologize for that. We're trying to sort that out right now. Um, look, I, I, w the thing that both of you guys kind of touched on that I think is so crucially important, and it's actually something I try to apply to my day to day life, is. Uh, is is the importance of maintain, managing and maintaining relationships. And that's one thing that I think both of you guys have always been able to impress me with because, mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't think you could be doing this at the level that both of you guys are doing it without, without having these relationships in place. You know, you, but here's the next question. If you're an independent artist and you have that relationship or you have this sort of like connection that kind of can help you, wh when is the point where you are pushing too hard at it and you can kind of push them away? Or like, how do you man? You know, what are some of those management techniques in in just preserving those relationships uh, for now, or for a week from now, or for five years from now? So, I, well, you know, th there's not a short answer to that question, uh, and they're all different because people are different, right? So, um, the the I think the the umbrella that we all have to live under is understanding other people's workflow, what is going to move them, and then also how to protect your clients at the same point because. You know, a lot of times artists feel the last thing they wrote is the best thing they wrote, and that's not necessarily the case. So you have to uh, empower the, the the creator you're working with to feel like they're going to continue being prolific and not not shoot them down. But at the same point, you can't you know you can't say to them, "Hey, I'm going to send this song to everybody," when you know that it may not be the best move. So there's a balance of uh, of, of empowering the creator but also protecting their business interests, even if they're not seeing that protection. So the relationship um, is really built over a course of time, usually, or a project that you've worked with that, that is underlined by trust. And you, as an artist, I think, need to trust in your manager that they have you know, the, the trust that's built with these other uh, executives or, or creators that's going to 
you know, build a, a path that, that best suits what you're trying to achieve. So, um, uh, you know, really, you know, when talking with different executives or studios or creators, whoever it is, you know, you know, I, I'm fortunate to have been in a spot as of Larry to have been doing this uh, for a period of time where, you know, you're able to, you know, navigate personality and and get right to the core of it. But at the same time, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're living and breathing in, in this relationship uh, on a daily basis and, and there's the, the trust there. So uh, I, I think that might answer your question, Justin. I, well, not... I, I like that because I think protecting is a big one. And I know that Larry and I, when we were working together, this was a big thing for you too, right? Which is sort of like the concept of, like, I know you like this song, but this song might not be as good as you think it is. And so in, sometimes you don't, you actually don't reach out to protect your client. Would you say that that's a fair assessment? Yeah, uh, much of my clients chagrin. I think at the career, sure, you know, year one, year two, I I didn't know what a good song was or even a good artist, you know. Um, uh, but and I would go out a little bit more cavalier and, and send some things out that today I would scoff at and laugh at and say, "There's no reason I should have done that." But you know, at the end of the day, I think as managers, if it's a song for a songwriter, producer, or if it's an artist that you're trying to, you know, get signed or something, I think you just really need to know your audience and know your audience and then know, and and kind of what I mean by that is if you're sending a song out for an artist to to pitch to or have them cut or whatever, you need to know who the artist is and know that, you know, there's probably a vision for the next album. What is that? Don't, send them something that sounds like what's on the radio now or what's on Spotify now, like that's just not going to work. And so I think it's trying to figure out, you know, delicately telling your clients, like, this doesn't sound like this is a, a winning song. This is not a hit song. Hit songs take time to find their home. They will find their home. And then hit artists will do the same. If you have a superstar artist and it feels like it's taking a while, you know, that's okay. That's not a bad thing. And I think that that comes with, you know, uh, making sure that you're talking to the right people about your artist or about your work, or about, you know, what you think is special because, you know, it's very important to not, if you're going to keep a relationship going, it's very important to not overdo it. It's, you know, you can, you know, aggressively uh, kind of be patient with how you build a relationship and, and uh, make it work for you in the future. Before we transition over to, to, to because I think that's an actually an excellent segue to talk about Lizzo and I actually want to talk about Jake. Uh, too, because uh, they have both found success sort of leveraging different platforms in a way. So I want to talk about that, but I just want to go back to one thing. Let's remove the layer of manager, right? So now I'm an independent artist and I uh, and and I want to start, how, how do I as an independent songwriter without a manager who I trust and, and believe in, right? And vice versa. How do I really look internally and go, is this the best that it can be? And how do I know when to make that step? I mean, Brad, do you want to take this one real quick? And then Larry? Yeah, I think there's, there's two answers to that question because it, it diff, there's a differential between artists and songwriter and producers, right? When we're talking about songwriters and producers, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're discussing like how the relationships that, you know, someone like Larry and I have built over the years can funnel music uh, in a timely fashion, but also understanding what the, the long-term strategy could be for the entire label group and or one particular artist but when you're talking about an independent artist and managing them uh it, that is themselves. sorry brad or managing themselves right an independent um, artist who also has to sort of represent themselves yeah yeah so so look you know we're in this amazing space right now where every platform is an opportunity to you know create exposure uh create monetization and and really desire both in and out of the the, the industry, right? So, uh, when you, when you're an independent uh, artist, right, there's really nothing holding anyone back these days. There's no gatekeeper uh, like there was once was, right? You know, it, it's almost the expectation now that you turn uh, your social profile, uh, your ability to 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 work with the DSPs or you know, the streaming services into a, a true template of analytics that a label can then compound, right? And you know, if you're an independent artist and you're trying to get the label's attention, 
and you're doing it by reaching out directly or thinking like you're you're going to get them to to be excited by something that already isn't popping then that's the opposite of how it really works when you do it right as an independent artist you're, you you don't need per se a manager in the very beginning because you're you're building your network you're building your community uh, you're tapping into a community but what when when you hit a inflection point where uh, there's a lot more activity that's driving you away from the creative. That's when I believe an artist manager really starts to help um, you know, work with the process of, uh, of directing and structuring and strategizing. So, you know, whereas you, you, know, you can have uh, a million followers on Instagram and you can have, uh, you know, a million followers on TikTok. And all of a sudden, when you start having those kind of numbers, you know, brands start coming at you, labels start coming at you, other producers start coming at you. And if you, as, a, an, as an independent artist, you're starting to spend more time on managing that process than actually doing what got you there in the first place. That's probably a good moment to think about, okay, you know, how do I build my business now and how do I structure it? Now, that's not to say that a manager can't be a, a confidant, it can't be an advocate, uh, and it can't, um, you know, like wave the flag uh, in their own right and bring attention. But ultimately, you know, a, a manager's role is going to help structure, build, compound uh, and strategize and not just do the work that independent artists actually need to do for themselves now. You know, it's hard enough to create music and it's super hard to build a profile in a social community, but there's no manager or there's no, uh, digital marketing company, or there's no um, you know entity that's going to say I could do that for them. That 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 re that responsibility now sits on the shoulders, for better or worse, with the independent artist. And then as that grows, you start thinking about okay, how does the manager you know start to expand my world and build my world with me, opposed to having to do it for me. It's interesting. I just wanted to be, because one of the things that I think. Uh, this is not meant to be a, a, a I'm, not, I'm not meaning to tap myself on the back here, but one of the things that I, I think is consistent with all with all of your clients, Brad, and all of your clients, Larry, is that the, the successful ones are very entrepreneurial unto themselves, aren't they? Like they're 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 the ones that are pushing, you know, they're in, in effect pushing you, right? And we've always said this: you can't work harder than your artist. If you work harder than your artist, it's a recipe for failure, right? So, so Larry, I, I want to I want to jump back to to the Lizzo conversation because I just love this story, and I think a lot of people don't realize that "Truth Hurts," which was I think probably the biggest one of the biggest songs of 2019, was actually probably recorded in 2015, right? I mean, 2016. It was. It, tell us the story a bit. Uh, actually, it was recorded in 2017. I think I was. I did a lot of this research last year because I was. You know, you when things happen a couple of years prior, you start to forget or when things, you know, you you gr you're grinding and you get exhausted and then, you know, things start to happen. I think you forget, you know, what it took to get there. But, um, yeah, I mean, she, we recorded that in probably June of 2017 and then released it in September of 2017. And, uh, you know, that was a tough year for her because we had. We signed her, I think I first saw her, she was opening for Slater Kinney in New York at Terminal 5 uh, in February of 2015. Um, we met her through uh, her current agent and Ricky's agent at the time, uh, Matthew Morgan. And he was like, yo, she's going to be at Terminal 5 next week if you guys are in New York. I'm like, actually, I'm going to be there. I'll stop through. And then saw it and then called him the next day and was like, man, I've never seen anything like it. Can you just, she was like, she's rapping. Cause she was rapping at the time. And it, you know, it was good, but not amazing. And I was like, I know, but like you make music and you're like really, really good at it. So can you just, just go in the studio with her? So she was finishing some touring and about a month later flew her out and they started working. Um, and then his, the magic of Ricky kind of came out with just asking her if she sang and then, she started singing and then adding some rap and things into it and then just end up working out. But, you know, to get from March of 2016, where we released good as hell to, you know, 2017, it was just tough because she thought that it should be going quicker. And, you know, she was getting the money, the things that money can't buy that I like to say is where 
you know, uh, this digital person at Vogue loved her. And so they featured her in Vogue. And then, you know, the people from Refinery29 loved her. And, you know, you just all this every once in a while. And, and actually, not every, every once in a while, but with good uh, recurrence, people just reach out and like, I love Lizzo. So let's do something. And we're like, dope. But, you know, you have so much of that over a period of time where you think that it's going to happen, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And, you know, you get exhausted. So I think, you know, 2015 or 2017 when they made the record we everyone kind of thought it was a thing but you know we weren't getting too excited because at that point we're just grinding and just you know look hopefully this works out you know if it doesn't we're going to keep going and so you know at our shows after it was released people would, her fans would be going crazy but you know spotify it wasn't taking off at spotify you know the the, the things that that you know are equated as hits today or getting to the radios to be a, a you know big fat hit or whatever just wasn't working those metrics weren't happening so um so then we ended up still grinding it out through 2018 she didn't release much music but she toured a lot she opened for Florence and Machine she toured with Heim she she did a lot of great things some a big Lollapalooza show and then 2019 you know or 2018 I think one of the biggest decisions we decided to do is just make an album you know, up until that point, we had done the EP and then released some singles. And it was just like, all right, bump it. Let's just make an album. She's doing enough that it people will like it and, you know, stream it and buy it. And so let's just get a body of work out there. We know that every time we put out music, this works out for this artist. And she levels up no matter what the level is she does. Touring gets bigger. It's fine. So we did that. And then it all changed in April of 2019. And that was paired with a big sync that we didn't really, we didn't, no one made it, you know, there's no fanfare about it. It was like, oh, she got a sync coming up, cool. Like- It was just business, right? It was just business. It was just straight business. It was like, yeah. Because she has, because she has so many syncs, you know, this isn't the normal artist where, you know, you get a few things and you're excited. Like this is somebody that had Cadillac commercials and Acura commercials all the time. There wasn't, it, we, it was really the, we're used to it. So, all right, another sync, cool, hopefully, you know, that continues to to put eyeballs on Lizzo. And, 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 you know, that business was very, 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 very helpful to get us to this point. Um, but it just so happened that she had a, you know, her second weekend show at Coachella. She, that, and the Friday before she was on that Sunday. So the Friday before she released an album and had that film come out with the sync of all syncs, which just showed the what a experience at a Lizzo show or an experience listening to Lizzo with your people should be and, and, and what really drew folks to Lizzo. And so having a girl broke up with a guy and her homegirl come in rapping and like going crazy with her to a Lizzo song was the experience that you would get at a show. So if you hadn't seen a show, you saw it in that, you know, in that scene. And that's what changed it because the song is amazing. You saw this like, whoa, I want to, you know, uh, I want to do it, do that with my people. OK, cool. And it just kind of took off from there. And, you know, like 20 months weeks later, later, we're like 20 months uh, later, right? 20 months exactly. later. Basically. Yeah, exactly. And and it was funny because a couple of days after after the it was like, I don't know if that, that Sunday because of song and the film or the film came out that Friday. I don't know if it was the day of a show or maybe Monday, we're like looking at Shazam and, and Truth Hurts was Shazamming number one in the U S and we're like, what's going on? You know, now she had had a little bit of a blip of success on TikTok with songs and Truth Hurts went, had a little moment. So, and it was a couple of weeks prior. So we're like, Oh, maybe, you know, maybe it's going crazy on TikTok again. And, and, but no, it was this, it was this film and everybody was like, okay, all right, what are we going to do? And then, and, uh, I never forget Julie Greenwald was like, we're chilling. We're, you know, sometimes these things go away. So let's relax. We're not going to just do anything hasty. We've got a plan. We're already, you know, promoting juice at radio. We're like, we're doing fine. No one, you know, freak out. And then a week goes by and she's like, nobody freak out. We're still good. It's good to see that it's still there. It's like, and we're like, what? This is the best thing that's ever happened to us. And you're talking about chill. And she's like, yep, just relax. It's fine. And then the next week, it was like, whoop, we're pivoting at radio. We're going, we're impacting, you know, Shazam's still going crazy. It, it like, and then the stream started happening. We, you know, we made some calls into Spotify, like, look, you see that what's happening, right? And they were like, yep, yeah, we're on it. And then, you know, 
next thing we know, we're charging up the charts. And then, you know, I'm like, cool, this is going to be a top 10 record on the Hot 100. Woo! I'm like, you know, this is tight. You know, and then, then that's when I kind of saw a record label go to work where they're like, nope, it's going to be a number one song. And then they're like, we're going to do this, this, this. They had this whole plan. And I was just like, wow, okay, this is what a major label is for. When it's time to make money and make a, and, you know, make a star a star, this is, you got to have one. We've always said, I mean, major labels, don't expect them to help you go from zero to 60, but they can take it, they can pick it up at 60 and, you know, take, take it, it up to 5,000. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, it's like, no. I've never seen anything like it. It was a very, very crazy experience. And um, I love sort of, you know, the, the the part that you're kind of almost in a way glossing over is the ability to sort of leverage these successes kind of one on top of the other. Right. And then kind of being like, oh, well, if this happens and this is good, let's take that and let's use it. And, and you, you also touched on the fact that I knew that, but I'm not sure a lot of people knew that Lizzo was doing just fine filming TV. You know, I mean, she I mean, she, I mean, she wasn't Lizzo like she is now, but, you know, she was. She had a nice life, no pun intended. She was she was living well. She was making money, but you know she really used that as a launching pad uh, to what uh, has ultimately become the one of I think one of the most sort of important artists in pop music. I want to I want to just kind of pivot over to Brad for a second here because um, Brad manages an artist that I've worked with that I work with also called Jake Miller, who's actually putting out a single next week uh, uh, on Friday. But, I like him. Yeah, Jake is great. Jake is great. We love him, and and the new record's really, really exceptional. I think the executive producer was pretty amazing on this project, if I remember. <laughs> but what I was going to say was, you always want to pat yourself on the back. <laughs> My back is so far away, um, you know. But but Jake, I think, is a a real master at social media, uh, and sort of taking these, leveraging these sort of successes, and 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 sort of, I don't know. Kind of helping the career side grow. I mean, Brad, you're watching this firsthand as it's, as it's developing. It, you know, it, it's a it's a pretty remarkable. Like I was saying before, it's a it's it's an amazing time for for independent artists and and artists in general just to you know express themselves in in various ways and different platforms, right? So, um, Jake was signed through uh, Warner Music uh, a number of years ago, and like many artists, you know. Uh, regime changes and timing didn't really work in his favor, and eventually it became a, a, a soured relationship, and he was dropped. But unlike many artists, which uh, allow their social profile and numbers to start uh, dissipating, he took the opposite approach and really leaned into it and started creating a, a pretty massive social profile for himself, particularly for an artist that uh, um, had come off a, a major and had really not that much going on. He regrouped. He released some independent music. He teamed up with the, um, w which is now the Orchard. It was Red Prior, um, to utilize their label services. But uh, ultimately, you know, his entire social profile was what drive what was driving uh, his fan engagement, both uh, in a tangible sense at shows as well as, um, you know, online. So, you know, he's he, he's still, you know, not now, but he's uh, he plays between a thousand cap, of, you know, twelve hundred cap rooms and. Uh, we're looking to push the elbows out, but you know the 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 online the similar. It's not similar to Lizzo in the same uh, sense where she was having success before uh, she blew up as an artist, but she found a path that was creating revenue and creating a structure that allowed when everything and then all the timing worked out, it allowed her to blow up, and and that's really the path that we're taking with Jake now. You know he uh, you know he he took a minute to kind of regroup on. What his sonic approach was going to be, and and has uh, uh, you know along with Justin created a sound that is is defining what his his EP and album is going to be, and and he does have a new song dropping next week, but um, remarkably, you know during quarantine when so many artists were uh, kind of figuring out like how to keep things fresh, build content that wasn't uh, the same as everyone else. You know, he took a very uh, novel approach, you know, and hopped on TikTok, right? He he never really spent any time on the platform whatsoever. And he was like, look, man, like, you know, I got time and I'm going to make these these quirky home videos. And they blew up, you know, and he was able to migrate, obviously, his his big social profiles from other platforms onto the TikTok platform. But, you know, he went from not having uh, any posts to doing a series called Quarantunes. 
uh, which you know now has him, I think, around 600,000 followers in four weeks. And he really took the the opportunity to to then translate that into a, a more um, outward platform, off platform, um, you know, perspective. And he ended up on Entertainment Tonight with a huge segment promoting his new single, Wall Street Journal, BuzzFeed, NBC, Fox. You know, he was able to really, uh, along with our PR team, um, you know, translate that into a new medium. But it all started uh, with him really leaning into fan engagement and his and his uh, ability to connect. Uh, on socials. So, uh, you know, we're, I think, you know, the first video that he did uh, on the platform is somewhere around like 8 million views at this point. And, um, and, and look, even if a, a small percentage of that are interested in him as an artist further than these, these novelty, these songs, you know, that's a good chunk of people to go and stream stuff. So, you know, we, you know, we're, we're doing that right now. So his single is going to premiere with, uh, you know, on uh, people.com and then, go wide next Friday. And, uh, and, you know, if we're fortunate, we'll have the same, you know, success that, uh, that uh, Larry's uh, team has had with Lizzo. (laughs) You said something really interesting that I think is so relevant. You know, it's easy to look at somebody like Jake or Lizzo and talk about fan engagement, right? Let's, let's say it's easy to talk about that. But I also think that fan engagement works if you are playing to 50 people in a club. Right. I mean, like there's the, I think the philosophies are still similar, don't you think? And, and it's just about building and growing that fan base over time. Yeah, 100 percent. Larry, I, didn't say that. I just want to jump in one quick. When I when I was a really young A&R guy at Epic um, and we were working with Good Charlotte. Right. Good Charlotte. I mean, this is going back a number of years ago. But, you know, to your point, Justin, you know, the reason why they ended up having a lot of success, particularly on their second record with Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, was because when they would play like, you know, Butte, Montana or, you know, uh, Des Moines, Iowa, and there was 36 people in the room, they spent the entire evening hanging and talking and 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 communicating with them. And then, you know, the next time that they would go back, those fans would tell their friends and it was the traditional story. So, yeah, I don't I think, you know, whether it's a digital landscape or it's a it's a physical one, which is going to be challenging for artists these days. You know, every last person in the beginning, it's certainly in the beginning, truly does matter. Yeah. I mean, look, you don't get to millions and millions of followers without you being able to engage two or five or 20 or, you know, 100, you know, Lizzo at the beginning. Of, of her, you know, when we signed her, she, you know, she didn't like the internet much. <laughs> like it wasn't her doing what she's doing now was like not happening. She didn't understand it. She didn't know why she should re- respond to her fans on Twitter or, you know, really, really care about Instagram. Like it wasn't a thing to her. Um, and then over time with some massaging, she just figured out what made it fun for her. And then it all kind of changed. I mean, I think, you know, it got to a point where, you know, her flute has an Instagram with way more followers than me. And I don't know how (laughs) flute does that, but you know, I, I, and I, and I asked her, I was like, why, why did you, cause it was, she created it. She created it, I think beginning of last year after she did Ellen or something. And it immediately jumped up to 20,000. And then I hear heads, I don't know what it has now. It might have over a million at this point, but, but she just said, it's fun. I was like, how do you have time for this? Because you're doing all this other stuff. She's like, ah, it's fun. So I think, you know, I, I, I think you, if you are a superstar artist, then you're a superstar artist when you have 50 people or five people watching you, you, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. You still have to, you still have to bring the fans in. You know, you I still have it. to, you still have to convince people to like you. You know, I say this all the time. It's like, you know, to, to clients and to artists that, that I'm working with, it's like, you know, the time is, you, you know, we need to love the music and then we need to get millions of people to think that we're right and then love the same thing that we love. That's all you're doing. You know, you're, you're just trying to make some great music. And I will say this for anyone who's on here, a songwriter, producer, artist or whatever, make the best music you can make, make you know, do not, you know, uh, I'm going to take a, a little word from Ricky. He, he did a, um, he did a, uh, a music business worldwide uh, interview the other day. And he was said something really poignant, which was um, in his career, he, 
it start he started to have success once he started to make music that he just believed in and loved and you know as opposed to i'm going to make pop songs so that's how he felt about it because he was you know wall wallpaper his band was you know um uh, satir- sat- satirizing pop music like he wasn't he was making fun of it it wasn't about him believing that he's a pop artist he was just out there talking shit really and you know and i think when he started to really make money is when he put his heart and soul into making the music and it didn't matter if it was pop music or not it was just great music to him and so that's when his life changed and you know he he just kind of has dived into that. So at whatever iteration and chapter in his life we're at now, he still feels the same way. And he's just having more fun and digging deeper and, you know, building relationships with other writers and producers that he thinks are creative and cool to keep him creative and cool. You know, he knows that he can't have all the ideas all the time and he collaborates really well with others and tries to find new and cool people that are awesome. And, and then it's been great. And that's how he continues to evolve himself. Like yeah. at the beginning, I mean, you know, I think Evan's on here when, when Evan signed him to publishing, you know, we would kind of listen to music and it's like, this is dope. And then like, I feel like every few months, I'm just like, whoa, okay. Yeah, this is, this is it. Okay, cool. And now he's the producer's producer. Like if you hang with him, he's just very intelligent, very poignant in his thoughts. He's like, super creative and just the nicest guy and that's what's gotten him this far you know and, and that's why he can create you know as he says create spaces in the studio for the artists to be you know uh artists to be comfortable and let their hair down so to speak it, you know i think that's a good point you know it's regardless of where you are in your career it's either you catch up to it or it catches up to you and when you hit that moment you know, not only the creator will know, but everyone around you will know, right? It just, it just feels uh, just so much more, uh, you know, relevant to the to the moment than trying to do something because someone else is doing it. So I, I think as a as a manager, um, you you have to kind of work through the progression at times of you know various phases or states of people's careers. Because that could happen on, on a couple of different runs. You know, that could happen two if you're lucky three times when you're successful. And you know, there's in-betweens where you know you have to find that moment again, like you're catching up to it or it's catching up to you. And and uh and that's the philosophy I take with with my clients, you know, with with again, like Dan the Automator, you know, he had his run in in the early, you know, aughts with uh, you know, with a number of different projects, including his own artist projects. But you know, how do you recreate? How do you build a new strategy for someone that's already seen success? And you know, for him in this case, it's in, it's primarily in scoring, although he is still doing producing work uh, and performing and DJing and so forth. But um, yeah, I think as a manager for a producer, songwriter, independent artist, a signed artist, you know, how do you help them recreate and get to that inflection point of like? All right, I hear this. This is working for me, and now it, it's going to reverberate and work for others. You know, that's that's part of the journey. One of the things too that I just want to, first, so first thing, guys, please, uh, we're starting to get some questions. Please continue putting your questions in the chat. Uh, I also just wanted to again remind everybody we're looking at at, at helping uh, organize and put together a video music library, and we'd love to talk to you about it and get some of your ideas. See if you think it's a good idea. We're pretty excited about it. So if you would like to participate in the conversation about, around it, just enter your email address into the chat and uh, Zan will be reaching out to you directly uh, to sort out uh, a time where we can all get back onto Zoom. I think it's a really exciting prospect and we'd like to share a little bit about it with you guys. That's a, pretty much all I want to talk about right now. You know, um, one of the things that both of you guys have, have discussed here that I think is really important, and then I want to start going to the questions is, you know, I think one of the key jobs that I see that makes a good manager a good manager is not only the relationships with their clients, uh, but their ability to be truthful in those in those conversations with their clients. And and also, probably the most important thing is how do you how do you tell your client? And imagine now you don't have a client, but you have to tell yourself when do you say yes to something and when do you say no to something. Those I think are, are are because both of those I think are very important aspects of of pushing your career forward. So, Larry, how do you determine what's a yes and what's a no? And is most things a no? Are most things a no? Uh, if it makes you feel good or bad, I think that's a big thing. Like, 
I there's many times things will come across my desk for Ricky or for and each client is different for you know Ricky and he's just like nah I'm like that's actually kind of good but okay but <laughs> or or I'm saying I don't know about that one he's like yeah you, you know and we've had conversations over the years because he got into this business because of the people because he loves people and he wants to always build a connection with someone uh an artist or a songwriter or producer and so if an artist would come up and, you know, a label would say, all right, I want Ricky to work with blah, 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 and, you know, produce the album. And I would go to him and like, yeah, I don't, this could be cool. Cause I don't take him everything, but something that I think that he's just not going to look at me like I'm crazy, but like take him something. And he definitely took on an album in the last couple of years that I was like, really? And, and he's just like, nope, I love the person. I love the singer. And uh, and ended up actually working out really well. I think he ended up being right because, you know, not for for the actual album, but for what happened out of that, the relationship that came from it and things that they did together after. Um, but it's about the people to him. You know, he would work with Tyler from 21 Pilots every day of the week if he could, just because Tyler's just such a great dude. And they're probably very similar um, in how they think and and work. but and different enough that it works really well together. Um, you know, there, I think that's just what it, what it's about. So, you know, dealing with him on situations, like there definitely stark differences between how I present things to him for creative. So if he's going to make an album or produce a song or whatever, and then, you know, if we're talking about a publishing deal, like, I'm, you know, very matter, you know, very analytical and this is what it is. This is what you would make. This is what they want. This is, you know, with those types of things and, you know, money and financing and that type of stuff, because, you know, I don't want him to have any questions or, you know, or if he does have questions, be able to clarify everything he wants. And then creatively, I think, OK, it, would he like this person, you know, um, outside, you know, are they doing well and is it really worth his time? But, you know, is, are you gonna, is he going to like the person? Is, does he are the managers great and the agents are great and you know, whatever, that's just kind of been something that I've always thought about. Um, um, but yeah, it's just like, does it make sense? Does it feel like a thing? If it doesn't to me, then it doesn't go to him. And if I'm on the fence, it goes to him. And I'm like, I'm on the fence. I don't know. What do you think? And then, you know, I want, cause I want him to feel good and know about things that really, you know, I feel are suitable. Well, Brad and, Brad and I, I've, I've been sort of, uh, I've created a bit of a concept called the critical path. And Brad is, um, has been really excellent at keeping me on the critical path. And uh, rather than me talk about it, Brad, maybe maybe you wanted to sort of give your, your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, to piggyback off what Larry was saying, when it comes to the, the business aspect and the structural side, I weigh a little bit more heavy on what I think is, is good versus bad or yes versus no. Uh, I, I just lean into my experience from being an A&R person, from being a publisher, and now have you know all of these different uh, you know parts of the industry in front of me as a manager, you know from agencies to you know publicists to to brand partnerships, etc. I feel very confident in the strategy laid out for each individual artist and, and saying, yeah, this is a good thing. No, maybe we should revisit this, or there's someone else. Um, but and and. Justin, close your ears because, uh, you know, I, I'm going to give up a couple of secrets. I do have to play mental jujitsu with some of my clients, knowing what they're going to say before they're going to say it. And then perhaps getting them to a place where uh, I, I think it's going to be a more constructive yes or sometimes no, but letting them kind of get to that point. So, so as managers, we do have to be a little bit of a ninja when it comes to uh, approaching, you know, the, individually how people work, and ultimately what's going to best service their their career. Um, Brad, but I, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, uh, I, don't, I don't get it, actually. I'm, I, you know what? I'm going to get fired by all my clients in a minute. Um, <laughs> you know, but but ultimately, I do let the creative be driven by the clients themselves. You know, uh, unless it's going to shoot themselves in the foot and. Everyone I work with, fortunately, is a professional, so they they tend not to do that. But um, you know, there's a there's a lot of times where, you know, look, do I, if I'm being honest, do I know what a hit song is? 
I know what I like, but will it be a hit? I don't know, man. I mean, there's so many variables. So I I feel like what Larry was saying before is like you know, you just kind of know if it's great, and then you hope that the the structure and the strategy that you lay out with the yeses and nos are are, are going to give it its best shot. But um, but Justin, I, I do want to just go back on your critical path um, commentary because that that actually is something not only that I've taken on board personally, but I've shared with others because it really does help cut down the noise. You know, there, there's there's so much that comes at us now, um, you know, both online and, uh, you know, and just in the in the real world. And it, it's sometimes really difficult to, you know, decide like, okay, cool, this is a good paying gig, but is this going to get me to where I need to be? And, and do I turn this down versus, you know, accepting it? And ultimately, if it's not going to get you to the goals that you've set for yourself or that you've set with your team, then it's already answered itself, right? If it's just going to waste time and put a couple of bucks in your pocket, you know, fortunately none of us are, are struggling to pay our rent, but at the same point, you know, you know, it, it is, it is important to realize like, okay, cool. You know, what is the noise and what is the sound, right? And you want to go where the sound is because that's going to bring you to ultimately your, your, your goal. And, and I think that's in its essence, you know, something, you know, I, I like to, to think of most times in, in my career as a learning moment. And, and certainly I learned a lot uh, working with Justin is, you know, this is a learning moment for me because there's a lot of times I'd be like, you know, let's just, let's just keep going. Let's just keep going. And then wade through all of the 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 the, the, the stuff, and now I'm just much more uh, strategic and strategy driven, and uh, and I kind of just sit back and let it unfold, and then decide which ones are, are, are the right things to go after, and and that really is the critical path, I, I would I would say, Justin. Yeah. So um, thank you. Yeah, you guys have been amazing, and we've talked for so long, and these these webinars, I mean, at least to me, they always fly by. Let's try and hit some. Let's try and hit a few questions. Um, we have we have Zan up perched in her uh, in her question tower, and she's about to hit us with uh, some some questions here. So hey, Zan, what's up? Hey, how's it going? Um, all right, this one's from Dana. Uh, I'm a new artist, recently signed with a reputable sync agent to TV and film. What's your advice from a manager's perspective on breaking a new artist through TV film placements? You can't make it happen, I'll say. You know, that is, I mean, if you're signed to that company, that must mean they feel like you're writing music that works really well for film TV. You know, there's not a lot. I mean, there are artists that have, you know, uh, music that does really well. Obviously, there are people that are, you know, there are people now that are kind of creating these bands to make music specifically for TV and film. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if your stuff works really well, that's amazing. And that's going to give you a platform, hopefully, as your relationships build with the, the film and TV side of things, uh, give you the platform to help break. Because over the years, there have been so many bands that have had you know success in an apple commercial and then that you know drives straight to you know radio success um republic has done that really well with a few bands and and artists and and things of that nature so you know look it's for me has been very uh successful with lizzo and then i uh, manage another artist named mckaylee 47 and she has some of that. Her music is energetic and up tempo. She raps and sings and all this stuff. So there, you know, uh, uh, a lot of brands and advertisers and and films and television shows use her music. She has a a big. Um, hopefully, it comes out in the fall. But they they moved it because of the pandemic. But she has a, a Spotify commercial that we're like over the moon about just because it's the way the way they represent the music and it's just really well done. And then earlier this year, she had the, one of her songs was in the Gatorade commercial with uh, Gabrielle Union and, Dame, uh, and uh, D Wade. So, you know, I think certain artists, it works really well. I mean, sometimes, you know, it breaks, it can break an artist and, you know, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes they don't gravitate to types of music, you know, uh, depending on the artist. Yeah, I, I think it just comes down to in the beginning, you know, uh, to make sure it's not a shitty deal that you're signing up for. I mean, there are a lot of bottom feeding sync companies out there that, you know, as a developing or independent artist, you need to be cautious of 
that's not to say that all of them are, but you know, you're exposed in the beginning part of your career to, to people who want to take advantage. So if you're going to do it, just make sure you're not giving away your ownership or you're giving away, you know, a, you know, to some amount of uh, percentage. And, you know, as Larry said, you know, it, you know, it's great to have people believe in you. Uh, it's great to have people pitch it, but you know, it's it, the, the sync world, um, there is a, a method to the madness. I, I mean, Justin is the, the, the king of it, really. Um, but in the beginning part, that took, a, that took a while to kind of craft and hone, and, 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 uh, and eventually he'll start mentoring others to, you know, and he's already done that to some degree, uh, others to kind of build into that capacity that he, he enjoys. But um, in the beginning, you, know, you, you just kind of hope that uh, the sync does connect. If you get a sync, it's a win. Right. I mean, any exposure for your song is a positive exposure for 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 the the song, and and then if it starts becoming a a, a poignant one, then then you might just kind of you know get lucky. I mean, Phantom Planets uh, broke their career off of a sync, you know, being um you know the you know the 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 title track for for the OC back in the day, um and that launched their careers, you know, both you know, as a band, but then independently where, you know, one of the guys is in Maroon 5 now and, you know, Alex was the, the musical director uh, for Mark Ronson for a number of years and, and it's brought the band back together. And ultimately, you know, it was because of a sync. So a sync can change how your career path grows. Uh, and if you have a, if you have a good one, it, you know, it, it might speed up the process, but, you know, just make sure that, you, know, you check that the sync deal is a, a good one because well, there are. You know, I mean, I kind of want to jump to that because we just we did discuss it. That was that was actually one of the reasons why we are trying to initiate a video music library for everybody. We don't we don't believe that artists should give up control of their ownerships at all, and we also don't think that they should be giving up these absurd percentages to library companies. And so this is a huge uh, aspect of what we're trying to build here, where into a video music library where. You keep the lion's share of your earnings, and you keep and you retain all of your ownerships, 100%. So we wanted to, it's kind of like what we've done in videos. We wanted to create something for the people, by the people, kind of in a way, and that's exactly the way we're approaching this library thing. So that's what I wanted to kind of talk to you guys about. That was a very unintentional uh, segue, but thank you for that, Brad. Um, so this is the conversation that we want to have with you guys because we think that we are actually about to revolutionize how the music library thing works, especially for artists. So we'll get into that conversation. That is not for now. Uh, Zan, uh, I think we have a couple more questions. We, we've done so. We've done such a good job talking that all of the answers have already been uh, pre-answered, all the questions. This one's from Keisha. Uh, what's the best way to pitch a song and to whom? Uh, let, let's assume that they're talking about how do, you know, how do they pitch an, a song to an artist and what's the best way to, to approach that? Larry seems like he's very opinionated on this matter. Please. No, no, no. I'm just thinking because there's so many ways, like, you know, I think, um, I think, well, I, it's, you have to have good relationships there, right? But it could, you know, a song could get on a Dale through a producer or a songwriter, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't have to go, like, I don't think she, you know, she would, no one would ever say that uh, she doesn't write her own music because I know she does. But like, you know, if you're Ryan working with Ryan Tedder and he's working on a Dale, he could probably get your idea to Adele, right? Or, you know, if you're, you know, you want to pitch a song for Doja Cat, you can go through her manager or a label. Like there's so many different ways to do it. I mean, I think for new people, you know, if you, you know, if you can write or you write a hit song, you know, then it's about trying to get it to a label person or maybe there's a manager that your hit song or hit idea sparks them to want to manage you because they feel like they can take that and make money with you um, and make you money. Um, so it's an interesting question. It's like a tough question because it's like, well, if you have a manager, then your manager will go do blah, 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 blah. But if you're doing it on your own, it's about just trying to build the scope of some relationships. And sometimes that can come from cold calling BMI and that person gets it to a songwriter person and then you become Ricky Reed because that's what happened to him. You know, well, one of my favorite stories, there's a couple <laughs> one is what is the song The Middle, right? Like the famous the, the Z song with with uh, Maren Morris is there, there's yeah. a, a really great video on the evolution of that song, which I, I you guys should all go to YouTube and look up the making of the song The Middle, because I think that's a really incredible story about how basically 
monsters and strangers who are well known and have been doing this stuff for a long time. They got it over to Gray, who got it over to Zed. You know, and it's like it, there was there was a whole process to the to, to the collaborative nature of how that song became that song. Uh, do we have uh, do we have any more uh, questions, Zan? Yeah, this one's from Keza. Any suggestions for a manager that has artists and producers? What project management or campaign management team collaboration tools you use? And then to manage release manage releases and rights management. I currently use DistroKid, SongTrust, and Midio. You know, there, it's not a one size fits all. So if you're happy with the platform you're using, then continue. And if you're not, there's other options. I guess is the most general way I can answer that question. Um, you know, uh, we found DistroKid to be super helpful in putting out music, and their back end is is really streamlined. Uh, but you know that's not for everybody, right? So, you know, there's other, you can go to two court. There's, there's different ways and different structures and how they pay out. Uh, each individual just has to find the one that fits best for them. You know, and, and the same thing goes for, you know, whether someone's using, you know, SoundCloud or someone's using, um, you know, Dropbox. I don't know, man. I, I mean, I, I don't know if I can answer that question cohesively. It just, it's kind of a process really. Those companies that she's using are, are good. I mean, you know, if you're going to use Disco, D DistroKid, you could use, uh, you know, there's TuneCore. There's other companies like that that can help get your music out and, dis and distributed. Um, yeah, it's, not a, it's not a plug for DistroKid, but I do like that you can pay one fee and, and, and upload as much as you would like, whereas I think TuneCore is, um, you know, charging by the upload. So. Again, like sure. different platforms have different structures, and you said decide what makes most sense for you. Uh, let's, uh, but yes, you definitely need to use Medio for copyright management. But that's actually one of the things that we're going to get into uh, with um, with with the library. That we actually, w my goal is how do we give away Medio for free for everybody? So this is kind of like what our concept is, and that's the conversation we want to get into. But that's it. You'll be getting an email from Sam. Uh, I think we have one more question, then I want to wrap it up because you guys have been super ultra generous with your time today. So, Zan. Uh, this is a two-parter from Craig. Who manages Lizzo's Instagram? And then can you be 48 and new and cool? <laughs> I'm not 48 yet, but I will be at some point, and hopefully I can still be new and cool. I guess you keep those you keep young, young and fresh people around you, and then you can be new and cool. Um, uh, and then, uh, yeah, Lizzo manages it herself. She has, I mean, obviously has people to put up some posts of, you know, tour announcements and things, but the general day to day is her. I, I think the voice of the artist coming across the socials is, uh, is paramount to it being successful because, you know, look, all of us can read through when something's promotional and, and um, and when something's personal, and and a lot of people turn off when it's promotional. So you know, someone like Jake Miller, who's got a million followers on Instagram, you know, he manages the schedule himself. He manages the content. Now we we help uh, build it or, or structure it so that when he's posting it, it's in his own voice. But uh, ultimately, you know, I think artists really do need to control their own social media because you know it, it is them. It's their you know profile online. <laughs> We got one more that just came in and then I want to wrap it up because I think that they are uh, really good questions and I think that they're paramount to your everyday conversations for both of you gentlemen. Um, Zane, you want to just read those last couple? Yeah, these are from George. Are you a part of any conversations regarding the long-term effects of the pandemic or larger live concerts? What do you envision will be the effect on artists being able to generate that stream of income and how are venues talking about adjusting? Well, yeah. <laughs> That's a big one, and and it's part of my everyday uh, conversations with with agents and promoters. Really, you know, we have uh, a Phantom Planet album dropping June nineteenth, and we have Jake Miller dropping uh, a new single May fifteenth, and both were meant to be supported by tours, all of which have been uh, pushed or or canceled. So. Uh, I would look if for anything, who knows what's going to really happen on, on the capacity level venues on, dis, you know, uh, if people have disposable income uh, and they want to go to a show, do they feel comfortable being at a show? So I, uh, from my perspective, most of the live performances are being pushed all to 2021, um, starting in, you know, in March in earnest, to be honest. Uh, you know, I, I'm, 
it's not announced yet, but I'm almost certain, wink, wink, that Coachella is not going to happen. And uh, and I think that's a real barometer for all the festivals and big shows. You know, and, and it's also it's very hard to tour um, or discuss touring because every municipality has a different law. Every state has a different structure. So, you know, you know we're trying to route something, but we don't even know if the venue will be allowed to have a certain amount of people or have the people at all. And then Live Nation, which is obviously one of the biggest promoters, they're they're reducing their guarantees. So when you're a touring act that's reliant upon guarantees and merch and your guarantees are being cut, you're not sure if there's going to be venues that are open. And then there could be capacity issues which limit the amount of merch you can sell from an economic standpoint. It's super challenging. So no one's really in my world looking to delve deep into that pool because it's so unknown for this part of the year. Um, hopefully, um, you know, the, the powers that be create a, um, a, a treatment or a vaccine that, you know, speeds up the process, but, you know, it, the whole touring sector has been decimated and it's, and it's important for an industry to not only just think about the artists, but there are a lot of people that work in the touring business, both big and small, everything from merch sellers to, to riggers, to, you know, audio and lighting technicians and truck drivers and caterers. So the, the, the pervasive, extensive, um, you know, decimation of this part of the business is prevalent. It's happening every day and it's reverberating. I mean, every agency, you know, with the exception of ICM right now, you know, has, you know, furloughed or fired, um, you know, agents, you know, in, in scores, if not hundreds. And, uh, and when it comes back, I think, uh, you know, people, it will be gauged by, you know, the finance people have in their pockets and the comfort level. So uh, it's a long answer to a relatively short question, but we deal with this every day. Now, the streaming part, I feel like we're in the Friendster mode. You know, everyone's trying to figure out what the platform of choice will be. You know, um, you know Zoom has become it for the most part with, uh, with, with conferencing. When it comes to live streams, leaving the Facebook Live and Instagram Live and stuff you know, to the side, it's a little bit different. When we're talking about paywall and structure, there's a few companies that are starting to to rear their head in this space. You know, there's, uh, there's Stage It, there's Veeps, um, there, there's a couple others. None have kind of gotten to that point where they're the go-to or the barometer. But um, I do feel the temperature of fans are starting to feel like it's okay to pay for uh, live streams, you know, I think Angel Olsen did thirty-eight thousand um, dollars, you know, in in virtual ticket sales, you know, just the other week, and ultimately that was a a huge hurdle to get over because no one wanted to see be seen as monetizing a pandemic, and now that this is the no, new norm to some degree until it shifts again, I feel that fans are just starting to get to that point where they're like, okay. You know, I may not go to a festival or go see a show, but I want to support my artist and uh, and I'm a fan and I'll, and I'll pay for it. And I don't think that's widespread yet, but it's definitely moving that direction and it's moving much quicker now than it was even two weeks ago. That was a thorough answer. Larry, do you have any thoughts on it? There, there are a couple of things. One, um, did you guys see uh, Mads Langer, the Denmark artist that had the drive-in show? He sold tickets, 500 tickets. Basically, he was on a stage, had a screen. I think they they uh, streamed the music through FM radio, and you had 500 cars drive in to watch his show. Obviously, it's in Denmark, but it's made you know press over here. I think it's in Forbes or something. But you know, and Evan publishes. Evan, yeah, and Evan signed him to 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 their company Camelot, and he's uh, you know Evan is you know I don't know if he's still on the call. I don't know if I see him, but. Um, but you know he he's always been really great at identifying the right kinds of people to to, to collaborate with. But we're not um, going to give Evan the credit of that he came up with the idea. But no, I, he, <laughs> he definitely picked the right person. But but no, you know I think you're you're going to find artists trying to be creative that way. I also saw that I think you know it might be a country artist or two are trying to find different topics <laughs> in the United States that um will that can have a show. You know, Brad, you talked about the different uh, municipalities that have different laws and how they're treating this. Um, so, you know, that could happen. And then, yeah, it'll be paying for live streams at some point or some type of virtual reality thing, or it's going to be something to get artists to the next 
to the time where there is a vaccine and people feel comfortable about going to a show. You know, I also heard talk of, you know, some venues having a, uh, a social distancing um, type of show where there's you know, 15,000 tickets in a, sta- in a, uh, a, in a, state or a stadium. And I don't think that's going to go anywhere just because it's just too much money to turn the lights on to have so little people there. Um, I, I, so. I agree. I think that might happen in smaller venues where they would normally be GA and they'd put seats and then everyone has to sit in the third seat type of thing. Um, but you know, to your point, Larry, I mean, like the, the hard cost of opening a venue doesn't change. You know, you still got to staff it. You still got to supply it. You still got to you know run it and pay the insurance and all that kind of stuff. So the, the mechanics don't change. And it's hard when you limit the capacity because you can only sell so many tickets. Right. I mean, the, the one thing, Larry, I'd love to get your thought on this, because um, obviously, you know, on the biggest end of the spectrum, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about. Uh, the gamification of shows, you know, obviously Travis Scott destroying it on Fortnite and Marshmallow even before the pandemic doing it. You know, I'm starting to see um, this this translate, you know, um, there's a, I'm just going to be a little bit coy because I'm not sure if they've announced it yet, but there's, uh, you know, like I said, Dan the Automator still has a DJ business in the uh, kind of throwback hip hop or backpack community. And he was meant to do a show in October, which has since been canceled and uh, a festival and now they're moving that onto it's not Fortnite, but it's another massive game that uh the, the people who are using minecraft i'm just going to say it would then go to a certain spot and then there would be an entry to this festival within that world and then uh however many people join you know the contract is based off of the the, the people that enter into that spot of the spot spot in the game so there, I think, is a much more forward uh, thought process moving quite quickly about the gamification of shows and, and avatars and how that works. I love that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's sort of like, you know, I mean, I think we're in a moment where the necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, I, hate to, I hate to sound so cliche, but, you know, we, we all need to find ways to kind of redefine how it is that we do things and how we work independently yet collaboratively and um, look, I know I know that we could probably keep going all day, and you guys have already been way more than generous with your time. Uh, I just wanted to thank you guys again. If you guys aren't following us uh, on our socials at We Are Midio, um, I want to thank Curtis Cerna, my partner at Midio.com, Zan Poka, who is the voice in the sky uh, monitoring the chats. I want to thank all of you guys for coming on board and being a part of these webinars. I actually can't believe how fast they're coming. I mean, I'm like, even last night I was talking to my wife. I'm like, oh my God, is it Friday already tomorrow? Like, it's crazy. So um, stay safe, Brad, Larry. Thank you so much for imparting your knowledge and wisdom uh, on all of us. I always learn when I talk to you guys. And uh, everybody, thank you so much. And look forward to uh, getting an email about participating in a music library conversation. Stay safe, Brad, Larry, thank you so much, you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, dude. Bye, everyone. Stay safe. Bye. Bye-bye.